Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your presence here in this place. Father, we just hunger and we thirst after your righteousness and after your grace. Father, we long for the preciousness of your Holy Spirit to come and engulf us with your presence one more time this night. Father, we just long for your presence. We long to bask in your anointing. Father, I thank you and I praise you, Father, that this night will be a special night because we approach your communion table this night. And I thank you that it's a holy and a reverent time. And Father, I thank you that lives will be changed, people will be healed, needs will be met as we partake of the broken body and the blood of the Lamb this night. And Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise in advance, Father, for everything that will be accomplished in every heart and in every life this night. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Be turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. In the early church, they met regularly and went from house to house and fellowship and broke bread together. And I don't think it's any accident that we have assembled tonight in this house to break the bread of life together. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Look at verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. That phrase, breaking bread from house to house. You remember, we <coughs> learned that this was partaking of the agape or the love feast that the early church <coughs> took off every time that they assembled together. You remember we covered in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul had to address the church at Corinth because they was abusing this agape or love feast. And some of them were getting drunk and some of them were eating all of the food and others were going hungry. And we learned that when the early church assembled, that breaking of bread from house to house was partaking of the agape or the love feast and the Eucharist which is another term for communion. The agape, or the love feast, and the Eucharist, or communion, both of them together are referred to as the Lord's Supper. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. I love this passage. It says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Notice this passage says that even though we are many, we are all one bread and we're all one body and we are all partakers of that one bread who is Jesus. And if you'll take your hand out, I gave you some scriptures and we will look at those. This will just save time from turning to the scriptures individually because I want to take time tonight for you to experience the Lord's table. I gave you the handout so you can read those scriptures and, and save us time from having to turn to each one. We are partakers of that one bread who is Jesus. Jesus said in John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus is the bread of life. And in John 17, 21, Jesus is praying for us 
in this whole chapter of John 17. And the Lord Jesus prayed that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. If it was important enough for Jesus to pray for us that we would be one, then should it not be the desire of our heart to be one in unity and in fellowship together, just as the early church experienced and just as Jesus prayed that we would be one. And when the early church met together to partake of the Lord's Supper and communion, it had a much more significant meaning to them than it does to us today because they had just come out from under the Old Testament laws where they celebrated the Feast of Passover and all of the other feasts. And tonight I want us to partake of the Lord's Supper the way that Jesus instructed his disciples and the early church to partake. We know that communion is such a vital part of the Lord's Supper, it being a part of the agape or the love feast and the Eucharist or communion, both them together being the Lord's Supper. And I want to share with you a little bit about the Feast of Passover because that is what Jesus was celebrating with his disciples that night when he took that bread and broke it and when he took that cup and passed it. He was partaking of a Passover meal with his disciples. Now, the Feast of Passover begins with the lighting of two candles accompanied by a blessing, and it's traditionally done by the mother of the house. And this represents the fact that Jesus the Messiah, the true light of the world, <coughs> entered into the earth through a woman. So I will ask the mother of this house where we are assembled to light the two candles and pray a blessing over this house. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus, the book of Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to learn a little bit about the Feast of Passover and how it applies to us today. Exodus 12 gives us a detailed description of the Passover being instituted. The Jews celebrated Passover. The Lord indeed passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when the death angel struck the Egyptians' houses, but the death angel spared the children of Israel's houses. He passed over over their houses. Let's read. I wish we had time to read this whole chapter because it's so wonderful, but I'll just read portions of it. Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Now watch this. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw or sodden at all with water. In other words, don't eat it boiled, but roast with fire. His head with his legs and with the puritans thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning 
and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand and ye shall eat it in haste it is the lord's passover for i will pass through the land of egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of egypt both man and beast and against all the gods of egypt i will execute judgment i am the lord and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout <laughs> your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now, skip down to verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in into your houses to smite you and ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever and it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worship and the children of israel went away and did as the lord had commanded moses and aaron so did they and it came to pass that at midnight the lord smote all the firstborn in the land of egypt from the firstborn of pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle and pharaoh rose up in the night he and all his servants and all the egyptians and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. Pharaoh got his heart right in a hurry, didn't he? Verse 33. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened. Now notice, they took their dough before it was leavened. Their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. Skip down to verse 39. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. Neither had they prepared for themselves any victuals. Now turn over to verse 46. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall you break a bone thereof and if you look on your handout in john 19 32 through 37 is the account of jesus being on the cross and the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first thief and the thief on the opposite side of jesus that was crucified when jesus was but when they came to jesus he was already dead and they did not break jesus legs and that was done of a fulfillment of a prophecy that the scripture should be fulfilled a bone of him shall not be broken verse 37 and again another scripture saith that they shall look on him whom they pierced and so just as the children of israel was instructed not to break a bone in the lamb that they sacrificed it fulfilled that scripture that not a bone 
of Jesus' body was broken. So in this passage in Exodus 12 that we've just read, we saw that all of the firstborn of the Egyptians were <coughs> slain or killed, and all of the firstborn of Israel was spared. Passover is also observed to celebrate the children of Israel's exodus from Egypt, them going out from bondage and going forth their exodus. And that's where the book of Exodus gets its name. Now the Passover lamb that was sacrificed was so significant. The laying down of its life, the shedding of its blood, the substitution of its flesh would replace the death of each Jewish family's firstborn son. And this is a type of our Lord Jesus. He is the first begotten Son of God, who also is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The firstborn son in every children of Israel's house was made to understand that his very life was being ransomed by that Passover lamb. And today we are the sons of God and we deserve to die for our sins. But the spotless lamb of God offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. That night in Egypt, the Israelites' lives were spared as they sacrificed that Passover lamb. And this is a beautiful picture of the Lamb of God who 1,500 years later would be offered in death at the Passover feast in Jerusalem. As the children of Israel ate that Passover meal, as they placed the Lamb in their mouth, healing and strength began to come into their physical bodies of every one that was sick. You know that out of all of those millions of Jews who were enthralled as slaves, you know there had to be many of them, a great number of them that were sick. But as they ate the lamb, healing came into their bodies. Psalms 105 verse 37, talking about the children of Israel, says, He brought them forth also with silver and gold. And what? There was not one feeble person among their tribes. Hallelujah! As they partook of that lamb, as they placed that lamb in their mouth, healing, strength began to come into their physical bodies. And the Lord brought them forth and there was not one, not even one feeble one or sick one among them. What a miracle. And as we partake of communion, and as we place that bread in our mouth, we are placing the lamb in our mouth, and healing will come into our bodies, just like it did in the bodies of the children of Israel. Now look at verse 3 in Exodus 12. Verses 3 and verse 6, three through 6, all in that passage, describes how they chose the lamb on the tenth day of the month. Verse 3, they chose it on the tenth day of the month. In verse 6, they kept that lamb up until the fourteenth day of the month to inspect it to be sure that it was without spot or without blemish because any <coughs> lamb that was crippled or had any imperfection was not to be offered as a sacrifice. So they kept that lamb up from the 10th to the 14th day to inspect it, to make sure it was without spot and without blemish. And do you know that our Lord Jesus fulfilled this requirement of scripture because the very day that the Pascal lamb was set apart our Lord Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday four days before the feast of Passover so that the people might examine him before choosing him as their lamb Jesus fulfilled every scripture and we know from the scriptures that Jesus became that Passover lamb. First Corinthians 5 and verse 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, 
as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And John the Baptist clearly marked our Lord Jesus as a blood sacrifice when he stated in John 1, 29, John said, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So John, when he looked at Jesus and he saw him coming, he saw a lamb coming that would take away the sin of the world. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Back in Egypt, the Jews marked their house with the blood of the lamb. They applied the blood to the lentils and to the two side posts. They marked their house with the blood. And do you know what that shape makes? Watch it. Yes, they marked their house with that blood on the lentils and on the side post. And that formed a cross. And that is what that was symbolic of when they were marking their house with the blood. Symbolic of the cross. And today, we as Christians have the blood of Jesus applied to our house or our temple. And when the enemy comes our way, he has to pass over us with whatever plague, with whatever sickness, with whatever disease he has because he has no right to put it on us because the blood of Jesus is applied to our heart and applied to our life and he cannot enter in. When we appropriate that blood and when we speak about that blood and when we remind him that the blood of Jesus is upon our house, our temple, and you have no right to enter into this house, we have to remind him and he has to pass over our house, our temple. Jesus, the lamb, was slain. He was that lamb slain. He was the lamb given. He was the lamb shared. He was the lamb who sacrificed himself in our stead. He is, he was, and he ever will be the lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. Let's read it. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain. Now watch, watch, watch. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is that Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. This first Passover lamb was to be totally destroyed. Its blood was to be put on the doorpost. Its flesh was to be eaten. And the rest of it, fleece, the wool, everything else was to be consumed by fire. This fire represented the divine judgment placed on that lamb. And at Calvary, the same judgment fell upon their sins. They were born by our suffering Savior. In separation from God, our Lord endured hell in order that we might be spared or passed over or saved. Jesus was that lamb roast with fire. He burned in hell for three days for our sins. And after his resurrection, the Lamb of God then entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven with his own blood. And now an entrance for all men has been made to come boldly before the throne of God. An entrance has been made through the blood of the Lamb for us to come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain grace and mercy and help in the time of need. That way to the throne was provided by our spotless, sinless Lamb who died for us, who took His blood into the heavenly Holy of Holies and made an access for us to enter in to the throne. And all of heaven sings praises now and they will throughout all eternity. They sing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and blessing. Revelation 5, 12. They say with a loud voice, Worthy 
is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Hallelujah. And one day we will join with them. Saying that also. In John chapter 19 verses 14 and 15. We know from this scripture that Jesus was crucified on the feast of Passover. It says... And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So it was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, when Jesus was being judged in Pilate's hall, he was at that very moment fulfilling that scripture in Exodus 12 and verse 6. When that lamb was to be killed in the evening. If you have a good reference Bible, you will have a note by that phrase, in the evening, which says, from the ninth to the eleventh hour. And Mark 15 verses 33 through 37 says that from the sixth to the ninth hour there was darkness. And at the ninth hour Jesus cried out, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? So our Lord Jesus died between the ninth and the eleventh hour. At the exact time that our Lord Jesus breathed his last breath was the exact moment that that Pascal lamb was being offered up and being slain. So, Jesus fulfilled this scripture to the very letter, to the exact moment in time. He breathed his last breath at the time this Passover lamb was being slain. And Jesus was taken off the cross and buried at sundown, now watch this, which marks the beginning of a new day according to God's calendar. A Jewish day doesn't begin in the morning like our days does. A Jewish day begins in the evening at sundown. A Jewish day goes from moon rise to moon down, where our day goes from sunrise to sundown. You remember? All throughout Genesis, the Lord would say, and the evening and the morning, the evening and the morning, He always, always, always mentioned the evening first. So a Jewish day begins at sundown. Don't forget that because it's so significant. The next day after Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leviticus 23, 6 says, and on the 15th day, now the Passover lamb was sacrificed on the 14th day, and on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days must ye eat unleavened bread. So Jesus was buried on the feast of unleavened bread because he was buried at sundown, which marks the beginning of a new day on the Jewish calendar. So our Lord Jesus was crucified on Passover, and he was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we know that the bread speaks of the body of our Lord Jesus. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And you remember I shared with you in an earlier teaching that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which in Hebrew means house of bread. So what more appropriate place for Jesus, our bread of life, to be born in than in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Now the bread itself is a picture of our Lord Jesus because that bread is pierced the bread is striped, and the bread has no leaven. And leaven in Scripture always represents sin. Now let's look at each of these three aspects of this bread for a moment. The bread is unleavened, is pure, and our Lord Jesus, our unleavened bread, He was without sin, He was pure, 
He was that spotless Lamb of God that was slain. And on the eve of the feast of the unleavened bread, the Jews would make a rigorous search all throughout their house looking for any crumbs of leaven. And when they found any crumbs of leaven in their house, they would take a wooden spoon and a feather and they would brush those crumbs up with that wooden spoon and with that feather. And what they would do then the next morning, they would take those crumbs and that wooden spoon and that feather and they would throw them into the fire and they would be burned. And we must make a rigorous search of our house, our body, our temple. Be careful and inspect it and put away any leaven from our house or our temple. We must make that rigorous search through every room in our house or our body and sweep it clean with the washing of the water of the Word and applying the blood of sprinkling to remove every trace of sin from our life. Anything that is not pleasing to our Lord Jesus. And the second thing about this bread is that it is pierced. It has holes in it. It's pierced. Which is a picture of our Lord's body. Zechariah 12 10 is a prophecy and it says I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn and in John 19:37 says, and again another scripture saith, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. And in John 19, verse 34, we know that one of the soldiers took a spear <coughs> and pierced our Lord's side, and forthwith came out blood and water. So our Lord Jesus, our precious loaf of unleavened bread, was pierced. And another thing about this bread is that it is striped. It is striped. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. So this bread is unleavened, it's pierced, and it's striped. Now at the Passover meal, they had a dish with three pieces of matzah or unleavened bread. And I was listening to a tape by Kenneth Copeland years ago and he made a statement. He said he knew a man who was a born again Jew and this man told Copeland that we had it all wrong when we observed the Lord's table. And it was out of that one statement that this study was born years ago. I thought the way we celebrate communion is wrong how should it be done then so i studied on the scripture for weeks and months and when i say that i've studied on the subject you know by now that that means that i read every scripture in the bible i looked up every word in the hebrew and in the greek i read jewish books i read commentaries i read everything i could get my hands on about communion before i started this teaching i had 84 pages of notes on communion and now I have well over a hundred pages on this one subject and I still can't put it into words. There are no words to describe the awesomeness of the meaning of the communion table. It's just too big to put into words. At that Passover meal, the leader or the head of the table would take three pieces of that matzah or that unleavened bread and he would place them in a pouch with pockets inside that pouch and when he would place the three pieces of the unleavened bread in that pouch he would take that middle piece of bread because there was all three pieces inside the pouch and he would go back to that middle piece of bread and he would take out that middle piece of bread and he would break it. and then he would take that piece of that middle piece of bread that he had just broken and he would put it inside a linen cloth and he would hide it and he wouldn't say anything about what he had just done he didn't offer any explanation at all he would just go right on with the Passover meal 
Now let me tell you what that represents. To Jews, it represented Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because Isaac was a type of Jesus. Because Abraham was to offer Isaac upon the altar as a sacrifice. And to those of us who are born again, that matzah, that middle piece of bread that is broken, and the three pieces together, a first one, the middle one that is taken and broken, and then that third piece of bread, to us Christians, we know that that represents God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in the middle of the feast, they take that middle piece of bread and break it and hide a piece of it. And that piece that is hidden is called the Afikoman. A-F-I-K-O-M-A-N. Afikoman. And it's a word of Greek origin, meaning a kind of dessert. And it is traditional that the children of the house will look for it and that they will find it. And before saying grace over the Passover meal, everyone partakes of a piece of that afikoman. The afikoman is the bread that we partake of at the communion table. The afikoman and the cup of wine is communion. So I want to ask the youngest member of this house to find the afikoman. It was searched throughout the house by the children. And the children would find the piece that was hidden. Go ahead and find it and then bring it to me. And the child that found it was given a reward <laughs> for finding the Afrikoman. Thank you. That middle piece of bread represents our Lord Jesus. He was sacrificed. He was broken for the sins of the world. He became the bread of life to us and we partake of Him. The bread which we break is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our matzah. He is our afkoman. He is our feast of unleavened bread. When that middle piece of bread was broken, it was wrapped in linen and hidden. And we know that Jesus is the hidden manna. Luke 23, Luke 23, beginning in verse 52. This man went into Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and he took it down. And what did he do with the body of Jesus? He wrapped it in linen and laid it in the sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. They're acting this out, and unless they're born again, they don't even realize it. But his body was wrapped in linen and hidden or placed in a tomb. But after three days, he was found because he was resurrected and he came forth from that tomb, which fulfilled the third feast, which is the feast of first fruits. This feast was held three days after the feast of unleavened bread. So Jesus was crucified on the feast of Passover. He was buried at sundown, which marks a new day on the Jewish calendar. So he was buried on the feast of unleavened bread. And he was resurrected or raised on the feast of first fruits. Jesus fulfilled these first three feasts. The feast of Passover. Jesus was that lamb slain. He died on the cross at the same time that every lamb was being sacrificed and being slain for that Passover meal for the children of Israel in their homes. Feast of unleavened bread, the breaking, the burying, and the resurrecting of that middle piece of bread represents our Lord Jesus. God performed this exact ceremony with the burial of our precious piece of unleavened bread on the exact day of this feast. Jesus was buried at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread since His body was interned at sundown on Passover day. Can you see that? He was crucified on Passover. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of first fruits. This feast was held on Sunday following the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leviticus 23, 10 and 11 says, Speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, When you come into the land which I have given to you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then shall you bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest 
shall wave it. So this feast was held on Sunday following the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits. Jesus was raised from the dead on that third day. Now during the Passover meal, the other two pieces of bread are eaten. And they are eaten with bitter herbs. You remember what we read in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 8? You remember it talked about the bitter herbs? So the other two pieces of bread are eaten during a Passover meal. Now I want you to notice it had been 1,500 years since that first Passover lamb was sacrificed in order to spare the children of Israel in Egypt. And now, some 1,500 years later, the Passover lamb arrived in Jerusalem at the time of the feast of Passover. The 12 disciples had little knowledge of the significance of their simple meal with the Master. They were ignorant of the Passover lamb being in their midst. They had no idea that as they took that broken bread, and that poured out wine from their Savior's hands, that those same hands would soon be nailed to a cross. They had no idea that in just a few short hours, Jesus would be offering himself as a supreme sacrifice for all men for all time. They did not know that as every lamb had been offered on 10 million altars, had looked forward to this point in history. So from that moment on, every communion service held like the one we're having tonight, every last supper celebrated looked back to that time. The Passover was celebrated looking ahead to the time when the Passover lamb would be sacrificed. Now today we partake of communion and we look back at that day when Jesus, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed. But the disciples had no idea that the lamb was there in their midst. But there was one at that table who knew, who fully understood what was facing him, as if it had already taken place. At this Passover feast, God acted to intervene on our behalf. He would share his own life, lay down his own body, spill his own blood in order to save us from our sin. That was God's way. That was the Son's way. That was love's way. That was the way of the cross. Turn to Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 15. And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And if you'll remember from our teaching last week, we learned that there are two cups of wine that is mentioned in the scriptures during this Passover meal. Verse 17 says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Luke is the only gospel writer that gives us this information. Luke is my main man because he is a man of details, and I love details. And he put this detail in the Word just for us. He mentioned that cup in verse 17, and then he mentioned another cup in verse 20. Likewise also the cup after supper saved. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. It was the cup after supper which Jesus said is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. You remember last week we learned that during the Passover meal there are four cups of wine which the participants drink. There's the cup of blessing, the cup of memory, the cup of redemption, the cup of hope and freedom. And you remember there's also that fifth cup of wine that's poured out and set on the table that no one drinks from, and that's the cup of Elijah. You remember we learned last week that when that cup was poured, that third cup, that cup after supper 
And when Jesus passed that cup to his disciples, he said this represented his blood. It was that third cup, the cup of redemption. He was saying to his disciples, I am your redeemer. We know that by the shedding of his blood, that redemption is provided for all mankind. Jesus offered the disciples this third cup. And you remember what that means? He was offering them and giving to them a marriage proposal. You remember we learned that when a man chose a woman that he wanted to marry, he and his father would go to that woman's house. They would take a marriage contract and a bride's price, and they would go to that woman's house and negotiate the bride's price. They would read the contents of that covenant. When the terms of that contract was agreed upon, the young boy would pour a cup of wine and he would offer it to the woman. He would hold it out to her and say, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. And he would set it down before her and she had a choice. She could either decide to pick that cup up and hand it back to him and say, no, I don't want to marry you. Or she could pick that cup up and drink it. And if she chose to pick that cup up and drink it, she was saying to him, I accept your offer. I will give you my life just as you are offering me your life. Because that young man, when he held that cup out and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, he was saying, I love you and I'm willing to give my life for you. Will you marry me? And it was this third cup the cup of redemption, the cup after supper that our Lord Jesus presented to his disciples. And it was that cup that he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. He was offering them a marriage proposal. And instead of speaking the traditional blessing over that third cup, which is blessed be the Lord God, creator of the fruit of the vine, that is what is always said at that point in every Passover meal. But our Lord Jesus didn't say that traditional blessing. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Our Lord Jesus came from his Father's house. He brought the New Testament with him. The New Testament, that new covenant, was written in his blood. And he offered himself in that laying down of his life that pouring out of his blood. After the woman drunk from that cup, immediately the young man jumped up from the table and left. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And that is what our Lord Jesus said, isn't it? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. He left this earth, went back to his father's house, and started preparing a mansion, just as that young Jewish boy would leave that house of the woman he had just proposed to go back to his father's house and begin building onto that house and preparing a mansion, a little bridal chamber for his bride. Our Lord Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there, you may be also. So, when that little bridal chamber was ready, remember from last week, the boy didn't decide when his wedding day was going to be. It was the father that made the decision when that bridal chamber, when that mansion was finished. He would inspect it from time to time to make sure it was well built and make sure it was beautiful because if it was left up to the sun, he would just throw anything together and it would be half falling down and he'd go get his bride, but it wasn't left up to him. It, only his father knew the day and the hour. And what did Jesus say? No man knows the day or the hour. Only my father in heaven. Praise the Lord. And when the father would inspect that bridal chamber, you remember we learned last week that when he determined that it was ready, he would say to his son, it is finished, go get your bride. And the bridegroom, his brothers, and his groomsmen would begin that wedding procession down the streets of the village. And Jewish weddings are normally held at night. And a herald would go before that wedding party. And they would send a scout out to check out the bride's house to make sure everything was quiet and make sure they could surprise her. And when the wedding party got close enough to the bride's house, they would send that herald. And that herald 
would go forth and cry. He would go forth with a shout and he would cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Behold, the bridegroom cometh! And when the bride heard that shout, she would immediately get up, she would light that lamp that she always kept by her bed because she wanted to have oil in that lamp. She would trim that lamp every night, make sure there was oil in it. She would light that lamp, get her veil on, and her and her bridesmaids that would be waiting with her, they would get up and they would go out and meet the bridegroom. And they would go forth through the streets to the bridegroom's house, to his mansion that he had prepared for his bride. And there they would be married. And what did Jesus say? He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And the word says that he will return with a shout. <laughs> when that herald cries, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. When that shout goes forth, we know that our bridegroom Jesus is coming for us. We know he is coming to take us with him to that mansion that he has been preparing for us for 2,000 years. We know that when we hear that shout, our beloved bridegroom is coming for us. And every time we partake of communion, when we partake of that cup, the Lord Jesus is giving us a marriage proposal. He is saying, will you marry me? And when we partake of that cup, when we pick that cup up, and when we drink from that cup, we're saying, yes, I will be your bride. I will marry you. I will wait for you till you come. I will make myself ready. The bride, the Lamb's wife, Revelation says, has made herself ready. Someone is required of us. We have to make ourselves ready for our bridegroom when he comes. And every time we partake of that cup, Jesus, our bridegroom, is giving us that marriage proposal. And when we drink from that cup, we're saying yes. <laughs> I will marry you I will be your bride that is what the communion table is all about now something else that you may have never noticed in the word something else that is also performed during that Passover meal is called the halal H-A-L-L-E-L -E -L, and that is the recital or the singing of songs they sing Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. That is a lot of singing, but they sing that every time they partake of that Passover meal. Jesus did this at the end of the Passover meal, the Last Supper with his disciples. Mark 14, verse 22. Mark 14, 22. As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Watch this, verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Had you ever noticed that they sang a hymn as part of their communion meal. I myself do not have a musical talent to sing the literal songs that they sing, but I like to sing at the end of communion. I'll sing, Oh, the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'll sing about that blood. Notice that he took bread, and it was one piece. They all ate of that one piece of bread. They all eat of that broken piece of matzah. They took the cup. It was from one cup which they all drank from and they sung a hymn. And my margin says a song. Now let's partake of communion and discern our Lord's body and also discern our own <coughs> body. And remember that as we place that bread in our mouth, we are placing the lamb in our mouth and healing will come into our bodies as we eat the lamb. Just as it did when the children of Israel ate that first Passover meal, when they placed the lamb in their mouth, healing came 
and let us discern the Lord's body. You remember we learned that 1 Corinthians 11, when it talks about discerning the Lord's body, is talking about our brothers and our sisters in the Lord. And let's come to the table in unity with our fellow believers. We're gathered here tonight in one mind and in one accord, in unity and in fellowship. And let's discern the body of our precious Lord Jesus. Did you know that in heaven it is as if Jesus' blood is now being shed for our sins? And we take it so lightly. At the throne of God, Jesus is represented as the Lamb newly slain. Revelation 5, 6 says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Notice it says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, stood a lamb as it had been slain. That phrase, stood a lamb, means a little delicate lambkin. And that phrase, as it had been slain, means as if it is now in the act of being offered. So important is the sacrificial offering of Christ in the sight of the Heavenly Father that He is still represented as being in the very act of pouring out His blood for the sins of man. He is taking away sin by that continual intercession of His blood in heaven. So let us partake of the Lord's table. Let us discern our own body and realize that as we place the lamb in our mouth, healing comes into our body and sickness must go. And let us discern our Lord's body. When we place that lamb in our mouth, we're placing the bread of life in our mouth. That bread that was pierced and struck and unleavened. The body of our Lord Jesus pierced for us. Striped. His body was beaten and whipped. And with His stripes, we are healed. And as we partake of the wine, let's discern that Jesus, His poured out blood, provides forgiveness and cleansing for us. And at this moment in heaven, it's as if our Lamb is pouring out His blood for our sins. So let's partake of our Lord's table. And after we're finished, let's sing a song or a hymn under Him. So we will partake of that middle piece of bread. That piece, that is the Afkona. That piece that was broken and hidden and buried and resurrected, representing the body of our Lord Jesus. Let us partake of that one piece of bread, the body of our Lord. So break off the piece and pass it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Father. We approach your table. In all and in reverence this morning. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We honor you and we recognize that as we place the lamb in our mouth, healing comes into our physical bodies, driving out sickness, driving out disease. It cannot stay. When we place the lamb in our mouth, healing comes in our bodies, just as it did the children of Israel. They went out and there was not one feeble one among their tribes. Father, as we partake of your broken body, as we place the lamb in our mouth, healing, healing comes into our bodies. The Lord Jesus said, He took bread and blessed and broke it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Healing is in our way. Thank you, Father. Healing is in our way. Oh, we love you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Healing, healing is flowing into our body. Everyone that is sick among us, healing now enters into their body because they place that lamb in their mouth. Father, we receive healing now in their physical bodies. We have partaken of the bread of life and your life now enters into us. As the Passover lamb, you came and you gave your life and was slain. It was for all mankind that you took their pain. So your precious blood would wipe away sin stain. It was on the cruel cross that you were hanged. 
in order that we might have life and power through your name. As punishment of our sins, we deserve death. But you took the blame and the raging storm of sin's power you did tame. For you are the spotless, sinless lamb who for us was slain. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And he said unto them, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. They all drank of that one cup. And he said, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Father, as we partake of this cup, we are partaking of the blood of the our Lord Jesus. We receive cleansing, forgiveness. Thank you, Father. We partake this cup. You are offering us that marriage proposal. You are saying to us, you are asking us this question, will you marry me? Will you be my bride? And as we partake of this cup, we are saying, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, Lord. We will be your bride, for we long to be right there by your side. And we long to walk with you down those streets of gold, walking hand in hand through ages untold. And we join with the heavenly host now that sing your praises and they resound. Praising, singing, worshiping, honoring Jesus Christ the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. We partake of your cup. And we say, yes, 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 Lord Jesus, yes, Lord. we will be your bride. We will marry you. Yes, we will wait for you yes. till you come for us to take us to that mansion that you're preparing for us. Yes, we say yes, yes as we partake of this cup. We are saying, yes, we'll be your bride. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly for your bride. Thank you. Lord, we love you. We worship you. Oh, we honor you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now in awe and reverence, we partake of the cup. And we gratefully and humbly now do so. We remember that it was on the cross that you was lifted up as you obediently drank from your bitter cup. The way of suffering you for us did go, so that one day you, we might come to know. Yes, it was for us that you chose to die, so that we might know you as our Savior. Oh, hi. Oh, how we long to behold your face, our Lord and our Savior, who chose to die in our place. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, you said, I choose to be obedient unto thee. Yes, you said, yes, I choose to drink from the bitter cup. You see, so that one day you might belong to me. Father, I thank you. Thank you that you drank that bitter cup for us so that one day, one day, we would belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. He gave the command to drink ye all of it. So anything that's left in the cup, you must drink. So I'll ask the head of her to finish our cup. I don't know why our Lord gave that command to drink ye all of it, but he did. Of the cup, he said, drink ye all of it. And then they sung a hymn, and he went out into the Mount of Olives. We join now with all of heaven and proclaim, Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We sing praises and honor and glory to your name. In heaven, at the throne, it is as if now, you are right now, at this moment, being slain to provide forgiveness for our sins as we call now 
on your knees. Let's join in, sing that song of worship and praise to Jesus, our Lamb. There was one other thing that our precious Lord did with his disciples, and I would like for us to do it tonight. He washed their feet. I would like for us to partake of this ordinance. If you have your Bible, turn to one passage in the book of John, chapter 13. John, chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel whereon he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who it should be, who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garment,